Hi, welcome to the Collective Online Experience. Yes, uh, no matter where you're tuning in from or where you're watching us today, I trust that the message that we've provided would greatly uh, empower and touch your lives. So, sit back, relax and enjoy, enjoy the experience. experience.
Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in and join our online service together. I hope that you are really blessed and have enjoyed the sermon series Faith Works from the book of James. Let us see James chapter 1 verse 9. It says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation. Because as a flower of the field he will pass away, for no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuit. I know in this pandemic situation, some of us are not doing good financially but maybe some of you are still doing good praise the lord or maybe even more better you are increasing financially but please understand what james tells us as a christian follower of christ let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation so i want to say this that as much as is as much as it is appropriate for the lowly to rejoice when they are lifted up by God and also it is appropriate for the high, the rich, maybe far more difficult to rejoice when they are brought to humiliation by trials, by problems and temptation. I like what the Lensky commentary says this. As the poor brother forgets all his earthly poverty, so the rich brother forgets all his earthly riches. By faith in Christ, the two are equals. So, if you are low in this present moment, take the fact that Jesus, God, will lift you up. Amen? And if you are high in this present moment, Realize that it is uh, temporary, not eternal. The riches of this world will fade away. And not just that, James says this, the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. My friend, please don't get me wrong on this. It doesn't mean that all the rich people will be excluded from heaven and only the poor people will be included into heaven. No, it doesn't mean like that. There are rich people who are godly and also poor people who are godly. And there are ungodly rich people and ungodly poor people. So the point is this. Never put our identity on the things that will fade away. One more time. Never put our identity on the things that will fade away. If we put our life, our identity, on things that fade away, we will fade away also. But how much better to put our life, our identity, into the things that will never fade away? If a man is only rich in this world, when he passes, when he dies, I mean, When he dies, he will leave his riches when he pass this world and live to the next. But what more glorious for you and me, my friend, to use our present riches to build God's kingdom for the glory of God. So when we die, we are not leaving our riches, but we are going to our riches. Do you remember? what Jesus mentions about the parable of the unjust towards and he was wise and Jesus said this in Luke 16 verse 9 and I say to you make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon that when you fail they may receive you into an everlasting home so come on we can bring our riches to heaven not that we bring our house our car 
our motorbikes, our phone to heaven, but by using our present riches to build God's kingdom, by using our riches to purchase our friends to heaven. I, I mean, uh, using our money for the mission, for the salvation of the people. So when we die, we are not leaving our riches, but we are going to our riches. My friends, I want to tell you this. When you give today, listen. Yes, the money that you give today will depart from your hands, but it will never depart from your life. Once more time. The money you give will depart from your hands, but will never depart from your life. So, my friends, there's many ways we can give today for the kingdom of God through the ministry of collective. There are mission fund. Yeah, we are, we hear that the O3 and our SS are raising fund five thousand to help the Bajau Lao fishermen in Kunak Sabah, and also. You can contribute for it also, so you, your giving will be celebrated in heaven, I mean. You also can give your tithe, offering, and future fund. So, there's many ways you can give, uh, how we can give today, but before that, let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this life, for everything that we have everything because of you thank you for your grace and bless every giver and all of our givings today in jesus name amen my friends uh on the screen there's the ways that how we can give today and please give uh, cheerfully and give generously god bless you Good morning, church. We hope that you are still enjoying the Faith Works series in the book of James. Before we look at our passage today, I would like to introduce you to the world which Jesus and his disciples lived in. It was pretty much like the world we postmoderns can relate to today. Uh, people were associating themselves with cliques. They were the invaders, the Romans, and the right-wing conservatives, the Pharisees, and then the right-wing but pro-invaders and often given powers and benefits, the Sadducees. And among these groups, there were those who were more radical fellow who also identified themselves as the Zealots. Yes, the Zealots. And even Jesus has an ex-Zealot -zeal, ex among his 12 apostles called Simon. The zealous agenda was to stir up a revolution to take over political and economic power from the Roman governments. So after Jesus resurrected and ascended, the hatred of zealots rose to its peaks because of the grassroots people were being poor and they were oppressed by the rich people and taxed heavily by the Romans. And furthermore, the Sadducees in Jerusalem were bartering the Romans up to gain benefits. But the zealots prided themselves as radical, zealous and pure. They would use violence to get their agenda done, especially in speeding up the establishing of the physical kingdom of God here on earth. So the Apostle Paul was also one of those before he became a Christian. Some of them even form a dagger club, and they call themselves the Sicarii. And um, 
You can read more of that in Acts chapter 21. In fact, they successfully created a riot about 10 years after James, the author, died. But as a result, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans until the temple was razed to the ground in AD 70, as Jesus predicted. So that's pretty much the kind of world before and after James wrote his letter. Now, people often tell me that students, the young people today are a bit slow, but you know, they don't watch online services and they can't process sermons. But I doubt that's true. So I'm going to give a Bible trivia now. Now, answer me the question. What is the name of the radical group I just mentioned who were going around wanting to overthrow the Romans and establish a new kingdom of God by violence and protest? All right, so if you are a student and you know the answer, send an SMS to 010-825-7573 with your answer, school or college number, and email. All right, that's 010-825-7573, as you can see on the screen, with your answer, your school or college name, and your email. Within 24 hours starting now, now in Malaysian time, every correct answer within or without Malaysia, whether you are in somewhere other parts of the world, we will send you an e-gift, which in physical copy is worth more than 100 ringgit. So, act now. But yes, that was the kind of world James was writing from and it was extremely difficult to live in if you are just a common citizen and worse for a Christian. And some were disheartened and gave up their faith while social bullying, hatred, bloodshed, abuse was prevalent. So with that in mind, let us look into our text for today. Here we go. James chapter 5, verse 19 to 20, the last two verses of the letter. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Let us pray. Father, we thank you today it is in the church calendar, the feast of Christ the King, where we remember Jesus as our King and Lord and Saviour. And Lord, we pray today that we will open up our hearts, the gates of our hearts, and let the King of glory come in. And Lord, we pray that you may speak to us and illumine our mind so that we may know you and from there we know ourselves. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Two months ago, one night, when I was reading and getting myself ready to go to bed, suddenly at 11 plus p.m., my mobile phone rang and I picked it up. Someone from the other side spoke to me in Bahasa and said, Are you Mr. Andrew? You have won yourself a prize as a user to, of a so-and-so debit card. Can you come to Jalan Raja Chulan and collect your prize tomorrow? Now, one part of me was immediately alarmed. I mean, hey, this cannot be true, right? 11 plus p.m., what's the odd? But another part of me, if I can be truly honest, was I was very curious to ask for further information and even disclose or even close to disclose my personal information. How many of you can identify with me what I said? Now, the naked truth is this, the human heart is so easily inclined to wanting for more and wanting it done my way and at my call. James calls it lust and passions, or in an NIV, evil desire and desires. We cannot let go of what we crave for once our ego is inflated to feel as if we were so close to becoming the owner of that prize. And therefore, we want to do all we can to secure that price, no matter how imaginary the price is. And that is usually what happens to people who fall into a scam like I almost did. Don't worry, I didn't. 
I declined that call and I said, look, I don't need the price. And I immediately hung up and reported it to the bank. So now you get the picture of why James uses the word patience four times in chapter 5 to warn the Christian Jews not to induce a man-made revolution, but persevere and wait for the Lord's return and He will make all things right again. Because God feels compassion with His people and He alone can judge righteously. In the same stroke, James reminded his, his audience that um, to walk their talk instead of talk their walk and redirect their talking to God in prayer. James seems to know that people tend to be passive while they wait and persevere. But he ended his letter by correcting that attitude with an active restoring of the backslidden Christian back to the Lord's community. And here is where our passage is found. So let us learn the principles in restoring a backslidden Christian back to the faith community while patiently waiting for God to restore the whole world. There are three things you need to know. That we are not that great. That we are not that necessary. And yet, we are not that small. So we are not that great because of our vulnerability as sinners. James said, My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way. You see, what started out as one of the brothers and sisters has the potential to be deceived and to be led astray from the truth and becomes a sinner. It tells us that no one is that great or too strong enough too spiritual enough, too invincible enough to be immune from falling into error, sin, and deception. It doesn't matter how many years you have been as a Christian. We ought to understand the more time we have, the fallen humanity in us will produce more sins until it becomes a multitude of sins. I mean, look at during our lockdown, how many domestic violence, divorce, child abuse, addiction cases have we recorded? Domestic violence alone recorded close to 2,000 cases since MCO, which usually is about 350. That means almost six times of increase. You know, I'm sure many of us still remember the episode where we were told to talk to our spouse with Doraemon voice, right? We were advised not, we were advised not for nothing. Why, should, why would family members for many years fight and quarrel if we are truly good humans without God? So what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you, said James. Isaiah said, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. James tries to show us in his letter that no Christian Jew can live freely as a Christian if they think that by following the law or the Torah with a form of religiosity would work. He says we all stumble in many ways, he said. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to bridle their entire body. Again and again, the scripture reminds us like a crystal clear mirror that even Jewish Christians and rabbis are prone to falling away from the truth. So may we not think that we are so confident that we can live as a Christian who roughly knows the truth or roughly knows the word of truth. In our world today, there are too many Christians who roughly know. Are you a Christian? Yes. Do you read the Bible? Kind of. How many years of, have you been going to church? Um, about 10 years. Do you believe in the gospel? Yes, of course. I'm from the evangelical church called Collect Collective. What is, and what is the gospel? Um, good news? Um, what kind of good news? Um, I guess Jesus died for me and cleansed my sins so I can go to heaven. Well, what do you know about Jesus dying for you? How do you know if he died for you? Can you show me from your life that you 
are, can really go to heaven. You see, many people are stuck here because all they knew about being a Christian never crossed anything more than they received a ticket to heaven, which is a false hope they got. But when you ask them about stock market, financial future, politics, their eyes lit up like traffic light. I mean, look at what James said. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourself. Do what it says. Show me your faith without deed and I will show you my faith by my deeds. In restoring backsliders to the truth, we had better known the gospel, the word of the truth, planted in us ourselves. The perfect law of liberty, the royal law found in scripture, the law that gives freedom. And these are the names James attributed to the scripture. If we don't look into it intently, we don't see our reflection, then what are the chances for us to do what it says? It is very important to realize that without God's grace sustaining our lives as the rod that we depend on and limp with, scarcely can we pass the test of faith and successfully persevere to the end. And that is why roughly no Christianity won't work. You don't go to heaven just because you join a church or give some donation or earn some titles in the church. And all your life you live as a roughly no Christian. You need to practice your trusting in God through careful learning of the Bible and faithful living of its truth. If you are currently just a roughly knowing follower of Christ, come to Jesus, confess your sins, renounce your divided life, and repent with a contrite heart. All you who are heavy laden, and He will give you rest. Secondly, we are not that necessary because we are only instruments. Let me explain. There is only one mediator between God and humanity. His name is Jesus Christ. But there are three things you need to remember. One, God can turn sinners back without our help. I mean, He has done it with Abraham. He has done it with Paul. No prophet preached to Abraham. God just called him and brought him out of Can uh, brought him to Canaan by his own voice. No pastor preached to Saul. Jesus just spoke to him on his way to Damascus and he came to know and even die for the truth. So God is the creator of the world and he needed no help or tool to do it. In the same way, he doesn't need any man or woman to convert backsliders to him even though he often uses them. And that's what we need to know. Two, when God uses us, it is to his honour that we are used. You see, when a chef goes camping in the wild and there is no proper tools to cook, even though he could cook without any tools, and every tool he could find is actually to his disadvantage rather than to his advantage, yet he cooks an awesome meal. Now, what can we say about it? that the tools manage to cook an awesome meal? Or it is the cook that cooks an awesome meal, even with the most inconvenient tools? In the same manner, when God uses us to reach out to backsliders or a sinner, it's not because He cannot do it without our help or agency, but it is only for His own glory. And therefore, most of the time, God still uses human as His instruments his servants, his word, and other means to bring us to the Saviour, all for his glory. And this should remind all of us preachers here and everywhere that your job is not to draw supporters to the word of God, except to preach the word of God as it is. And do not add to yourself the burden of whether hearts are converted or not, but be more concerned if you have preached the gospel message clear enough or not, faithfully enough or not. It doesn't mean we should be lazy or refuse to improve, no. God will still use His children as instruments and you must be ready at all times. But converting sinners and backsliders is only the secondary purpose of why we preach the gospel. The primary purpose is to glorify God, as Charles Spurgeon puts it. 
And three, just because God uses us to turn others back, it doesn't necessarily mean we are converted. Now, just let that thought sink in a bit. God can use a donkey to speak to Balaam. God can use unhygienic ravens to grab food for Elijah. God can use wicked kings to discipline his own people, Israel. God can use Pilate's conversation with Jesus to reveal Christ to us. And now we read in Scripture today. But all the instruments above did not necessarily turn to God. And it is especially true for the author James, the brother of the Lord. He was a latecomer in believing in Jesus. He stayed in the same house with Jesus. He was raised up by the same mother, most likely inherited the same carpentry skills with Jesus. Yet, it didn't make him a believer. He and the other siblings even ridiculed Jesus in the Gospel of John that, you know, something like, hey, why didn't you take the opportunity during the feast to make public appearance and go viral since you so wanted to be radical? When Jesus was crucified, James was not even there at Calvary. How do we know that? Because Jesus had no sibling to entrust his mother to except the youngest of his 12 disciples, John. See, it took him a long while before he believed in Jesus as his Messiah which is at the time when the reason Jesus appeared to him. But once he got it, there was no turning back. He went all the way and became a prominent voice in the leadership of the Christian community of Jerusalem. Look at the beginning of his letter. How did he write to the Christian Jews scattered all around? How did he address himself? Hey guys, I'm the real bro of Jesus Christ. No. What did he say? He said, James, a born servant of God and of the Lord, not bro, the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. See, we are not that necessary because of our instrumentality. We are just instruments of God. And that is why we count it an honour that God would even use us. And lastly, we are not that small because of our ministry as the church. Before we fall into an inferiority complex. Let us also hear clearly from James. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wonder from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Why did Jesus give his church to the world? Since the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, we see that the biggest purpose of the church is to proclaim the good news of her master, Jesus Christ, to the dying world. Not to do social works, not to build business empire, or to become an iconic local landmark. Those things are good, but primarily to announce the gospel that the world is dying without a saviour. But the saviour has also come that they may be saved. See, during the beginning of the lockdown in particular, we see many videos of medical frontliners, doctors, nurses, and many more risking their lives, working inhumane hours to save lives. And some of them were even sacrificed in the midst of their services. You see, to save a dying person from the brink of death brought so much joy and relief to our hearts, even though we know that one day their lives will also still expire. How much more when you can get to save or rescue a person's soul from the brink of spiritual and eternal death? And how much more when the prodigal son returns home, a multitude of sins are stopped from spreading further and now covered over? And this is what it means when Paul says that God through Christ gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them, not imputing people's sin against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. My friends, don't preach the gospel trying to collect trophies, trying to show to others 
you know, how many souls you have reached out to, as if the longer the list, the more saintly you are. But at the same time, don't let anyone make you think that preaching the gospel and persuading someone who have gone astray is too big tasks for you, that you must take a 40-day and 40-night evangelism, evangelism boot camp courses before you can actually confidently talk to someone about coming to Jesus. Don't complicate Jesus. Don't help Jesus to be relevant. Jesus himself is eternally relevant. The body without the spirit is a dead body. So trusting in God is like the body. When you only say you trust in Jesus, but there's nothing too different from your trusting in Jesus and my trusting in other things, there's nothing evident about your trusting in Jesus. And when your trusting in Jesus is so hidden, so invulnerable and not transparent, so afraid to suffer for the one who suffered for you, so easily given up when stormy days come, so individualistic that even the Bible cannot change you. Then James says, that kind of faith is useless. About two to three weeks ago, I received news from a long-time member of our church, whom I shall not name. To start with, his job was badly hit by the pandemic. Because of his job nature, he was deep into addictions of smoking, vaping, weed, alcohol, and everything else except other drugs. He has act actively attempted to get rid of those addictions, but this lockdown period has plunged him into further frustration and deep depression trying to kick the addictions. He just couldn't seem to find recovery. And being far away from home because of certain circumstances did not help either. One day, overwhelmed by a sense of defeat and meaninglessness, it was his second or third attempt to take his own life. And he made sure no one was at home. He planned everything neatly to hang himself. But just when he ran the plan, his rope snapped. He was utterly disappointed with himself. And not long after, he received a phone call from me out of nowhere. It wasn't planned, I don't know. He wasn't ready at that time for a conversation, so he texted me to talk a couple of days later. But that day, he thought he had only two choices, either to end his life or to talk to someone for help, which he hadn't done it yet. When I finally got to know what happened behind all this, I was simply stunned. It was a wake-up call for me personally. Not because I was anything prophetic, as someone may think, but I was seized and grieved by the very thought. Because in that few hours, I might have lost a friend forever. And when I read this verse that James wrote, it resonated so strongly with me that why am I thinking so hard to walk someone back to the truth safely? Why didn't I think about how narrow that escape can be from death for that someone who is being walked home to God safely? And how many more souls out there that we can simply just reach out to not by intelligent or hyper-creative or our ultra-relevant church growth programs, but simply with our normal human temperature. To love my neighbour as myself, as James said, the royal law. Why did we make Christianity so sophisticated? When simply by where we are working at, or where we are living at, our apartment, our taman, our office block, our grocery store, our e-learning classroom. These are the places we can simply live as doers of the word. And then we can be used by God to bring someone home safely to Jesus. This is what evangelism is all about. This is what loving people is all about. So are you ready? to walk some backsliders home safely? Are you ready to engage someone with the gospel and bring them back to the truth? 
how to not feel small when our church world has conditioned us to feel that if I win someone to Jesus, then I'm great? Or how do I find motivation to turn someone back to Jesus? Or perhaps you are that someone who needs to be walked home safely today. Know that we are not that great because of our vulnerability as sinners too. We are not that necessary because of our instrumentality in God. We are not that small only because this is our ministry. There is no ministry, my friends, except when it is entrusted to us by Christ. And why did James tell the Christian Jews to actively, actively turn the backsliders and sinners back to the truth? Not just praying, but actively turn them. Not so that we grow our membership, not so that, you know, they are cleverly programmed to be busy with something so that other issues, other conflicts can be swept under the carpet. He said that simply because this is what Christ did and what Christ would do. James called his elder brother, his own elder brother, his Lord Jesus Christ, while he is his master's born servant. Or slave for life. What has Jesus done? What would our master have done when a friend is at the verge of drowning into the sea of death of no return? Why are these two verses the perfect ending for the letter of James? Because Jesus, our master, didn't just teach some methods about how to swim to the dying person. He reached out his hand and saved the sinners from the eternal death and by taking the place of dying on Himself, right at the cross. Today, will you let Jesus walk you home safely? Will you also walk someone home safely to Jesus? Jesus said, What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The same way we have been given grace, that is the same grace that compels us to do the same to others. And this, my friends, is the ministry our Lord has entrusted to us, his church. And that is the perfect closing according to James. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let the goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to lift the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Let us pray. Father, we come before you knowing that our vulnerability as sinners, knowing that we are not that strong. And your word says in James that God resists the proud but exalts the humble. And we come to you and acknowledge our weaknesses. Lord, we indeed need a saviour. We so desperately need a saviour. And we need you to guide us, remind us, inspire us and encourage us that we may not just think about ourselves, to love ourselves and to indulge in our own desires and passions and lust alone. But we will learn to carry the cross daily, denying ourselves, looking out for our wayward brothers and sisters and turn them back to Jesus with a contrite heart, with our wounds in our, in our souls, in ourselves, knowing that if God can heal our own wounds, God also can heal them back. And I pray, O oh God, for those right now who desperately need to turn back, 
or have never known the Saviour Jesus Christ. We pray that you alone would draw them now to come back to you because not a prodigal son or daughter who turns back will be rejected because Lord, you never leave us, you never forsake us. You are our good shepherd and you know just right there all the details that happens in our heart. Thank you, Father. We submit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that prayer and it's the first time you, get, you come to know Jesus, we would really love to get to know you and pray together with you. Our leaders, our pastors, our leaders and our elders would love to connect with you and to guide you so that you know how to start this journey or to restart this journey with Jesus. I hope you have a great weekend. God bless you. I hope you have been uh, blessed and impacted by the message that we've prepared for you today. If in any way that the message is spoken to you and if any prayer requests or needs, uh, feel free to talk to us through these platforms that are made available. We want to connect with you and journey with you. And if you want to be a part of what we're doing uh, through this period, you can also give with all this uh, platform made available and be a part of our ministry as we share the message of God's love and hope to the rest of the world. Thank you now. See you the next time.